Hey everybody, my name is Quinn, and I'm so excited to be here today. I'm going to be talking about publishing updates with Expo and React Native. On the roadmap for today, I'm going to be talking about what exactly an update is, and different policies you can specify to deploy updates to your end users. I'll also be talking about different kinds of app runtimes, and in the case you have many different app runtimes, how to visualize all those updates. And in the case where you make a mistake, I'll also be talking about republishing updates. But before we talk about all of that, I want to talk about big corporations. And these are, these are usually the companies that have thousands and thousands of employees. At big corporations, instead of using messaging applications that we're generally familiar with, like Slack, that's OK, um, they'll usually choose to make their own internal chat apps. And at big corporations, instead of using repository services like GitHub that we're all familiar with, a lot of them will opt to roll their own internal repository services. So now I want you to imagine that you're the tech lead at a big corporation, and you're responsible for an app called the Employee Success App. You know, these are the type of apps that they require all the employees at the company to download to ensure their success. When you open up this app, at the home screen, you'll typically see your employee avatar, your name, for example, Bob the employee. You can see that he's level four, and he joined on January 2017. In the, in the different tabs, you can see the employee benefits, and whenever Big Corp wants to push an announcement to you, you can see that in the messages tab. Of course, as the tech lead, you've chosen to make this app with React Native. Now imagine that one day, the great leader of the big corporation makes a huge announcement. He says that everybody needs to work from the office now. And as the tech lead, you're responsible for doing something about this. Now fortunately for you, it's really easy to implement this announcement. All you have to do is render a banner, and tell everybody that they got to work from the office now. And while the implementation is relatively simple, getting it out to your end users is slightly harder. So I'm going to go over how to do that with the update tools that we made. Several years ago, we made this tool called Expo Publish. And we got a lot of feedback from folks over the years, so we went ahead and decided to build a new thing. The new thing we built is called EAS Update. And the main difference between EAS Update and the older Expo Publish is that EAS Update works with all React Native apps. There's also a better, more ergonomic workflow. So the way you use this is you open up your command line and you run the EAS Update command. You provide a branch name. So for example, it's production in this case and you provide a human-readable message. And right now, we've implemented the new employee policy. So let's take a look at how updates are delivered to your end users. In our Employee Success app, we've installed a module called Expo Updates. And this is responsible for calling out to the update server and asking for the newest app update. The server will realize that you last deployed the banner telling everybody to work from the office, so it's going to deliver it to you. So let's take a look at the end user's perspective. They're going to see the original version of the app. And upon the next reload, we're going to see the newer version with the banner. Now, a lot of you might be wondering, how exactly are these updates being delivered to the end users, and what amount of control do you have over it? So we have different policies that you can specify. And the first one I'll go over is the default policy that comes out of the box. So by default, at time zero, on the first time you re when the first time you open an app, you see the splash screen. And right away, we will query for the newest update in the background. Okay, when all that is happening, we will show the old update that is already loaded on the phone. Now, let's look at the second time the user opens up the app. As usual, they'll see the splash screen, but right away, we'll load the update we previously downloaded. All right, 
So let's take a look at the trade-offs of this policy. The good part of it is that it minimizes TTI, so the user doesn't have to wait long to see any kind of experience. But the downside is that it takes a little longer for the user to get any kind of update. All right, so let's imagine that you're not really happy with this default policy. Say you want your users to get updates a little bit sooner. So you can specify a policy like fallback to cache timeout in your app.json in order to accomplish this. In our example, we set it to three seconds. The way this will work is that the user will open their app, and as usual, they'll see the splash screen, and right away, we'll start downloading the new update. Now, in the happy case, we've downloaded the update very quickly. So say, for example, at 500 milliseconds, we'll show it to the user right away. But now I want you to imagine the worst possible case. Say if we start downloading the app and we see the splash screen as usual, but at 500 milliseconds, we notice that the user has really, really bad internet. And in the absolute worst case scenario, at three seconds, say if we haven't even downloaded this update, we want the user to see something. So what we'll do is we'll fall back to the old update. If we look at the trade-offs for this policy, we'll see that on the downside, there's a longer TTI. So in the worst case scenario, you're going to have to wait three seconds to see an update. But on the upside, users are able to get updates faster. And if you aren't happy with any of the policies that come out of the box, you can roll your own. Um, so for example, in our updates module, we've exposed the JavaScript API in order for you to create your own custom policy. For example, there are methods to check for new updates or to reload your app or to fetch an update. All right, so I'll quickly go over what exactly an update is. In any given React Native app, we split everything into two main categories. The first category is the update layer, and this comprises of your JavaScript and your TypeScript code in addition to your image assets. And these are typically all the things that can change with an update. In the second category, it's, we call it the native layer, and this is usually the stuff that is considered immutable. This is your app configuration, your app icon, and more, most importantly, it's all the native code inside your binary. This cannot be changed with an update, and in order for any of this to change, you will need to get an update from the App Store or the Play Store. All right, so now the great leader has a new big announcement. He says that not only does everybody need to work from the office now, but everybody has to work there at least 40 hours a week. And as the tech lead, you're responsible for doing something about it. So you have a big brain idea. You think to yourself, well, what if I enforce this with location tracking? If I know where the user is at all times, I can figure out how long they've been spending in the office. So let's take a look at how we're going to implement location tracking in our app. Recall that we have two categories of layers. We've got the update layer, which is your JavaScript and TypeScript code that can change, and the native layer, which is your native code that can't change with an update. What you're going to do is probably go to NPM, download a stable location package, and when you install it, a lot of native files will get installed into your app. And most notably, you're going to see a lot of Kotlin and Swift files. And these are the routines that let you access the native device APIs, like, say, GPS. And because you want to track the user's location, you're probably going to define some file, something like location.ts, and call out to get the location's like, current position. And for example, say we're on the Android platform, once this code is run, it's going to map directly to a routine defined in the location continent module. So to recap, now that we've made location tracking, we've got two versions of our app. We've got the original version with our basic application logic, basic native modules, and we've got our second version with location tracking. And the main difference here is that we've got a native location module in the native layer. 
And this is what the end user sees. Whenever they go into office, we track their current location, and we can show Bob, the employee, his progress. So in this example, we can see Bob has been in office 28 hours this week, and that's not bad at all. All right, so as a tech lead, you're never satisfied with the status quo. You always strive to be better. So let's take a look at how we can make a small improvement to this app. Let's say that you want to make a small enhancement, like show a green dot when the employee is in the office, so you can see their progress in real time. The logic is quite simple. You get the location of the user, and once you know the office coordinates, you can figure out the distance they are from office, and maybe if you adjust for about half a kilometer, you can choose to conditionally render a green dot that way. And then once you're comfortable with this implementation, you deploy it using EAS update and provide a human readable message. For example, show a green dot when the user is in office. So let's quickly go over how exactly these two app runtimes will receive an update with our original app and the location app with tracking. In our app with location tracking, we're going to query to the servers for the newest update. The server is going to remember that the last update you deployed is this green dot update, and it's going to give it to you. Now, when this location code runs, it's going to map directly to a routine defined in the native location module. And because that exists in this version of the app, we're all good. But now let's look at our original app. It's also going to query the server for the newest update. And assuming that that's all the information that there was in the query, the server is going to return the green dot update. And when that code is run, it's going to try to call into the routine defined in the native location module. Unfortunately, that doesn't really exist in the original app. And an error will be thrown. But fortunately, we would recover from this and reload the app using an old update. I have an asterisk here because error recovery is a bit nuanced in different cases. But in this particular example, when the initial app render fails, we're going to assume that the new update just wasn't good, and we're going to fall, to the, fall back to the old update. All right. So when we reload the app, the user will get rerouted back to the home screen and see the older version. All right. So the main takeaway from this example is that not all updates are compatible with all runtimes. So for example, our green dot update was only compatible with the tracking app but it was not compatible with the original app. And the main reason for that is the difference in the native layers. One has the native location module, and the other one does not. And because there is a difference at the native layer, we'd say that they have different runtimes. So let's try this again. Instead of the tracking app asking for just the newest update, it's going to ask the server for the newest update compatible with its runtime. As usual, the server gives back the green dot update. And because we have a native location module, everything works out. But now let's look at the original app. This time, we're not just going to query for the newest update, but we're going to query for it for the compatible runtime. And this time, the server is going to look and say, there aren't any new updates. So the original app is going to continue running as is. Because you can have many different app runtimes, it can be hard to visualize what exact updates they're going to get. So at Expo, we've made a UI called the Deployments UI to help you visualize that. For example, in the app with location tracking, we can see that we've deployed it to production. And we can see in the right here that whenever a user with this app version queries for a new update, we're going to show the green dot when the user is in office. All right. So I'm going to take a step back from mobile development, and I want to talk about how web development works today. Imagine that you're on the Chrome browsers, and you're looking at various websites on the internet. In your Chrome application, you, got, you have your website JavaScript, and you also have the browser runtime. 
So these are the web sockets, the web storage APIs, what have you. Whenever you request for website JavaScript, that's delivered to you by your web server. And this usually happens often. But now let's see, let's imagine if W3C re releases a standard and the Chrome team decides to update the API. We call this a browser runtime change. Say, for example, you improve the WebSocket API. Whenever you want a new version of your browser runtime, the Google Chrome servers are going to deliver that to you. And relative to the amount of times you request for your JavaScript API, this happens rarely. So when we look at how our version of mobile development works, we have our app JavaScript, and that's delivered to us by the update servers, and that happens relatively often. If we look at the native runtime for our mobile development, whenever that changes, that's delivered by the Google Play Store or the App Store, and it happens relatively rarely. And given that we have the same model as web development, one of the upsides is that if we implement features that are in the JavaScript layer or they're like image assets, they can be deployed to our end users with relative ease and with relative speed. All right, so enough about that. The great leader has a new announcement. And not only does he want you to show up to the office all the time, but he says that if you don't show up, we're going to have to assume you have resigned. And as the tech lead, of course, you're responsible for doing something about that. So you think to yourself, well, what if we implemented auto-resignation? So let's take a look at what would be required to implement auto-resignation in your app. Fortunately for you, you don't really need to put in any native layers or any native modules, but you're just going to have to have a TypeScript um, file with your auto-resignation logic. So from the end user's perspective, let's just imagine that Bob, the employee, hasn't been in office for very long. Say he's only been in office eight hours this week. We're going to show him that he's been resigned. Because, well, if you haven't been in office, that's equivalent to resigning. When you're comfortable with this implementation, you're going to deploy it to production, and it's going to be released to the users. So everybody's going to have, at the big corporation, is going to have the old version of the app initially. But as they reload, people are slowly going to be having this resignation version. And as people start getting this, you realize that they become really upset. Some employees say that they don't want to resign. And other employees say, screw it, I'll just go work for Twitter instead. You realize that this is all a huge, huge mistake. And you realize that you don't really want to deliver this resignation app. You really want to deliver your old update, the green dot when the users are in office. So all of the updates that you deploy have a group ID that can be queried in our systems. If you want to redeploy a previous update, what you do is in the command line, you'd specify the group ID as well as a republish flag. And when this happens, um, what the users will see is that instead of the resignation version of the app, on their next reload, they're going to be seeing the older publish that you've deployed. All right, so that's pretty much all the EES updates features in a nutshell and a crash course. Thank you so much for listening. And if you have any questions, you can DM me on Twitter.